Welcome to our uh, Christmas morning service. We celebrate the greatest gift, the mighty King. So stand this morning and sing out to him. Mighty King, you rule the nation.
wonderful God. We give praise and thanks to him. Every good thing the Bible says has come down from heaven. It's come down from the Father of lights. The light came into the darkness. And I don't know about you, but Jesus Christ, his light came into my life. And I've seen it again and again and again. The light of Christ. We want to pray today. There's people right now in their Christmas rather than being a joyous time. Although it is for a lot of people, obviously, but for some people it's a dark time. There's people, and uh, you know, I've been going up the hospital visiting my mum. There's people there, and they're walking out of the hospital, not looking real stoked about uh, the season that we're in. And people going through stuff, and uh, there's people that are lonely. There's people that are lost, and we want to take time and pray for people that uh, need the grace of God, need Jesus Christ. We're going to stand in the gap and intercede for them. Take a moment, open our service in a word of prayer. A couple of things. As well, we can uh, join in for. Just want to pray for souls in Newcastle as we outreach, as the churches outreach, as people outreach, that people would come to Christ. Pray for families. There's a lot of breakdown today in families. Want to pray for a connection or reconnection in lives by the grace of God, by the hand of God upon people's hearts. If they go, man, I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to take the first step. I'm going to say sorry. I'm going to do whatever it takes to, you know, uh, connect that love that's maybe not there. I want to pray also for our baby churches. I want to pray we've got a baby church in Auckland, in Hornsby, and in Gdynia, in Poland. I want to pray for them, God's grace, God's blessing upon their lives, and particularly for the Maclean's in Gdynia, um, that the hand of God to be upon them as a family as they're away from, you know, uh, what's normal for them at Christmas time. And so let's take time, and I'm sure there's things in your life that you want to pray about, and I encourage you to do that. We're going to pray. We're going to invite the Holy Ghost. Uh, to have his way in the service, speak to our heart. We're going to get Josh to pray, open us in a word of prayer in just a moment. Let's take time. Father, we just come in the name of Jesus before you. God, we come with thankfulness, God. We come, God, with confidence, not even boldness, God, regarding your promises you desire that none of you lost, Lord. You've came to set the captive free, to heal the brokenhearted, Jesus. We pray for our city, Lord. We pray, God, for these people we've mentioned, God, people right now that are in darkness, people right now that are lost. God, would you lift these knees before your throne right now? I pray your hands be upon our baby churches this Christmas season. God, we lift up right now the church in Virginia, Poland. God, cause there to be an outbreak of revival in that place. God, I pray, bless the McLean's as they would labor, God, on our behalf, God, as we have sent them, God, that they would do your will in that place, God. I pray that you bless them this Christmas season, God, in this uh, this change of operating rhythm for their entire family, God. We lift up right now the Stevens and the Reddies, God. Bless, God, these uh, families that would uh, continue to do your will, God, and would minister in our baby churches, God. I pray that your hand will be upon this service this morning, God. Meet us in this place. Anoint Pastor Staples by your Holy Spirit, God, that we would leave here this morning challenged and changed. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Great to see you in church. If you're visiting, very, very welcome here today. Good to see you. Uh, take a moment, introduce yourself to somebody, encourage somebody as you find your seat. If you've tuned in on the live stream, great to have you with us. God bless you today. Walk me out again this morning. Great to see you in church on a on a Sunday, on a Christmas day. My goodness, another year. It's like, whoa, another Christmas. Exciting stuff, good stuff. Have a great Christmas. Can I say that? Have I said that over the last week or so? I probably have. Have a great Christmas season, praying for you by name, praying for you and your family, praying for God's grace in your life over this season. A couple of things I want to announce and uh, just invite you to the evening service. It's not an evening service tonight. It's just a, it's a fellowship, it's a barbecue, it's a picnic, whatever you want it to be down at Nobby's Beach. If you're free, uh, encourage you to come along, bring one of your friends, bring your neighbour, bring a workmate, bring someone along. Half past five from, uh, meeting from half past five down at Nobby's. And uh, bring some games, bring some swimmers, bring whatever you want to bring. And uh, that'll be a great time. Regular service Wednesday night, 
7 p.m. Invite you to come out for that. And then Saturday night, uh, New Year's Eve Fellowship, 6 p.m. to be announced where that's going to be, what we're going to be doing for that. Um, and then regular service next Sunday. And so appreciate everybody. Appreciate you coming out to all of those things, supporting those things and your faithfulness throughout the year. I want to take an offering uh, this morning and I was reading the story about 67-year-old carpenter Russell Herman. He died in 1994 and uh, uh, his will included a staggering set of bequests included in the plan for distribution was more than $2 billion for the city of East St. Louis. St. Louis, another billion and a half for the state of Illinois, two and a half billion for the national forest system. And to top off the list, Herman left six trillion dollars to the government to help pay off the national debt. And that sounds fairly uh, amazing, doesn't it? Incredibly generous. But the, the small problem was, is that his only real asset was a 1983 Oldsmobile. <laughs> and so he didn't have that money, he didn't have anything like that, but he was, uh, he, he, he was wishing maybe that he could, or, you know, uh, I don't know what he was thinking, but uh, he made great pronouncements, but uh, there was no real generosity involved because he didn't have anything. <laughs> and I'll, I say that to say this, that, uh, you know, uh, we don't want to be people that talk about giving, we don't want to be people that make great pronouncements, I'm going to go I'm next year, I'm making a big pledge, and I met a guy one time, we were in India, and he said, Pastor, I'm going to give a big offering to the church, I said, that's awesome, brother, praise God, just put in the regular uh, offering time, never saw him again, and so, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe moved on to bigger and better things, I don't know what happened, but we never saw that big offering, um, <laughs> And so Jesus in Luke 21, verse 3 and 4, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. She made a sacrificial gift. She gave, made a wholehearted gift and, and she, she did it. She didn't talk about it. She didn't, you know, uh, uh, you know say, I'm going to do something after I die, which is what the, the will is there. But... Uh, she actually did something and Jesus saw that and he sees you and he sees me and he sees our wholeheartedness. He sees our sacrificial giving to support the work of God, to support the work in Poland during the year. Um, and God sees that and God will reward you in due time for those things. We're going to pray. Appreciate you giving this morning. I understand most people give uh, via EFT these days. God bless you. Appreciate that. But if you've got cash and you'd like to give, the ushers are going to take a, a take the bag around. Stu's going to pray for us next year. Father God, we do thank you, God, for our blessing, for the blessings on our lives, God. God, I pray this morning you'll bless the gift and giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thanks. And so while they're uh, taking that around, maybe, uh, Jess, if you're able to put that video on. And uh, just got an end of year message from, uh, or a Christmas uh, message from Pastor Scott McLean um, in Poland. And so... Praise God, we can roll with that when you're ready. Hello, Newcastle Church. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and give you a one-year update of the top five things that God has done since we arrived here in Poland just over 12 months ago. Number five on the list is our arrival. There were a number of challenges to get here because of COVID and other issues, but once we got here, even though we were strangers in a strange land, we were able to get an Airbnb and then eventually find an apartment with three bedrooms, which was an achievement in itself. While we miss our family and friends back in Australia, it's been an amazing experience to be able to come to Europe and see God begin a new church here in Poland. Number four is starting the church. Gdansk is part of a tri-city area that also includes Sopot and Gdynia. And after being here for just a few weeks and exploring and praying where to start, we really felt led to go to Gdynia and we were able to find a great hall. It looks nondescript on the outside, but everyone seems to know where it is when we invite them out. It's affordable and the administrator is easy to deal with and it's a great starting point for our church. We've had numbers of outreaches, including an English club, Aussie culture nights, movie and games nights. The most successful events have been concerts and visiting speakers. Number three on the list is impact teams. We've had three teams so far, two from the Netherlands and one from England. And when they come here, they make a big difference on the streets. And it's great to get to know the amazing fellowship we're a part of here in Europe. Number two has been the people we've been able to connect to so far. We have numbers of people that come to church and one of the most recent is a girl who got saved with our most recent impact team from England. Like every pioneering scene, it's challenging, but 
God has been faithful. We've had very few services without anyone turning up. And I'm aware of the massive ongoing costs in supporting a missionary work. And every person who gets saved or is even witnessed to would not have had that opportunity without many people giving sacrificially and our mother church being willing to take the leap of faith and invest in us to get here and support us. Number one is Poland itself. This is an amazing country of 40 million people right in the heart of Europe with a rich history of overcoming adversity. And even though there's massive Catholic influence, very few people have been touched with a genuine gospel message. The potential for people to get saved and for capable disciples to be raised up is exciting. We're believing for a time of significant advancement in 2023 with a number of teams from the United Kingdom and the Netherlands coming for us in the next 12 months and a team of True Blue Aussies from our mother church in Newcastle. Please continue to pray for my family and I and for the work here in Poland. As we say in Poland, Wesołych Świąt Bożego Narodzenia, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, have a great 2023. So uh, on the back of that, please continue to give. Please continue to keep them in your prayers. And it's exciting that we can, as uh, people, we understand Jesus gets all the glory. And without him, we wouldn't even be in that church. But we're a small church in Newcastle, but we're able to reach people in different places in the world because of discipleship, because of God's plan, of uh, master plan of evangelism in the earth. And uh, I don't know about you, but every time I get a little uh, snippet from Pastor Scott and see his family there, it's uh, it's very, very moving for me. And uh, I, I personally up the ante. It's like, man, I'm praying for them. I'm praying for their day to day. I'm praying for fruitfulness for their lives. Praise God. We're going to look at the Word of God together. 2 Corinthians. If you've got a Bible, don't worry. I'm going to read it. It's going to come up on the screen as well. But 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 8 and just one verse. We're going to read that in just a moment. And uh, it's great to give, isn't it? Christmas is a time, I don't know about you, but I love to give something It's and to see people, especially when you give something to somebody and it touches them. It's like something they like or it's something they needed or it's something that just like, uh, you know, it's like, whoa, oh, thank you. They're appreciative and you've given the right thing. And, you know, when you get the, wow, thanks so much, that's exactly what I wanted or, you know, even better, that's what I needed. It's, uh, it, it touches our heart. Can you say, man, who enjoys giving like that? And uh, what I want to minister this morning is that God knows exactly what we needed. It may not have been what we wanted. And uh, many people didn't want Jesus. I didn't want Jesus until I realized I needed Jesus. And now I want him all the more. But uh, I want to minister on the ultimate gift this morning from 2 Corinthians and chapter 8 and verse 9. The Bible says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, you through his poverty might become rich. What a powerful verse of scripture and a powerful understanding that I believe God wants to reinforce in your heart, in your mind this morning. I want to look firstly for a minute at the fact the Bible there tells us that Jesus was rich. And so who'd like to be rich this morning? Oh, yeah, a bit, a bit ambivalent this morning. That's okay. We'll take another offering then if you don't want to be rich. Um, we're, we're happy to have a rich church. We can do more for Jesus. Anyway, I want to talk about being rich. And someone said this. They said, rich is relative. And that's entirely true. What a true statement. Rich is relative. In Australia, I'm not considered rich. A house that I don't own. I don't own a house at all. Uh, the, the, the car that I drive, the, my bank balance, my superannuation, whatever it is. I'm not considered rich in, in Australia, but we spent some time a number of years ago in India and people would tell me all the time, you are rich. You are rich to the point that after a season being there, and I'd initially try and explain to them, well, back in my country, back in Australia, I'm not really rich in our car and try and tell them our kids went to this school and this happened and that, and, uh, and they just didn't didn't believe me this is your white you're rich and uh, look at you look where you're eating look at the car you've got, look, and uh, anyway and uh, and so they were convinced that I was rich and after a time it's like I became incredibly convinced that I was rich as well because compared with somebody else in relation to other people I was tremendously rich over there if I was to ask you the question this morning who do you know who is rich who's the richest person that you know Think about that for a second. The richest person that you know. And there's a guy and he uh, he owns our building. 
and we rent uh, we rent this building off him, and he owns the building next door as well. And uh, I would say that he's rich. I know another guy and uh, he's got a very expensive car and he's got a very uh, expensive house and he also owns a business centre with many businesses in that business centre. He owns it and rents it out and he's rich as well. I know another guy and he sells real estate, huge parcels of land to overseas developers and gets huge commissions for doing that and uh, he too is rich this morning and so compared to most of us, this morning, these people I've just outlined, three people that I know, um, they're rich. And, uh, and it's true, yet compared to movie actors, some movie actors, they're, they're, they're not very rich at all. And uh, I was reading in uh, you know, an article, Brad Pitt is worth about $300 million. And uh, his, his ex, Janice, Jennifer Aniston's worth about $320 million. Mel Gibson, uh, Aussie actor, he's, he's worth uh, supposedly $425 million. Uh, Simon Cowell, he's not an actor, is he an actor? I don't know if he's an actor. He's, you know, uh, he's equal with Tom Cruise on about $600 million. And, uh, and then uh, Jerry Seinfeld, I was surprised, he's worth a billion dollars. And Oprah Winfrey is worth $3.5 billion. It's like, my goodness. I'm in the wrong game. <laughs> And so these folks are really rich, aren't they? They're not just rich, they're really, really rich. Yet compared with corporate figures, I was reading the Forbes billionaires list for 2022, which I often do. You know, <laughs> read it every year just to see maybe I've made the list. You know? And uh, in 2021, some people are like this, but uh, be careful. Anyway, but in 2021, Mark Zuckerberg was number five. Who knows who Mark Zuckerberg is? We know Mark Zuckerberg. And he was number five and he had about $97 billion. And in 2022, a year later, he's 15th. He's dropped down the list with only, only $67.3 billion. He lost about $30 billion last year. You thought you had a bad year. <laughs> He, lost, he went down by about $30 billion. It's like, whoa, that's not so great. Bill Gates was number two in 2020. And he got divorced and dropped to number four in 2021. That's a bad year. But he's bounced back. Okay, he's still number four, but he's had about a $5 billion increase to $129 billion. And so Bill's had a good year, it would appear, if, if this is the yardstick of what a good year is. Jeff Bezos, or Bezos, he dropped from number one to number two in 2022. He was dethroned as the richest man in the world. And, uh, and it looks like, you know, when you look at this, the figures, it looks like he didn't make any money in 2022. And uh, he's, so, he, he's just, both years, 2021 and 2022, 171 billion. And my question is, how can you have $171 billion in equity and not make any money for the year? My, my, my goodness. Invest it, bro. Put it, put it in, uh, you know, some, in the bank, man. You'll get more money. Anyway, and so how, how can you do that? And so the new number one, drum roll, brrr, for 2022, you know who it is. It's Elon Musk. He's, he's, uh, he's uh, number one and he's apparently worth about $219 billion. He's doing a bit better than owning a couple of buildings in Newcastle or selling some real estate in Sydney. He's, uh, he's like, whoa. And so these folks are the richest in the world. And yet compared with Jesus, the text says that Jesus was rich. It says he was rich. And so how rich was he? How, how rich was Jesus? Was he more rich than uh, Mel Gibson? Was he richer than Oprah Winfrey? Has he got more than Elon? Absolutely. One commentator, Bible commentator said this, as the saying goes, the average rich fly first class. The medium rich charter a jet. The super rich own the jet and the incredibly rich own the airline. But Jesus Christ owns the skies. Jesus Christ owns the, the planets and the galaxies. Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Colossians 1, verse 15 and 16, it says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. I don't know about you, but that boggles my mind about how rich Jesus is. He's the creator and the owner of absolutely everything. He wasn't the head of Tesla or, or the owner of Instagram or Facebook or Amazon. He wasn't the face of America's Got Talent. Jesus is the head and rightful owner of all things. And he was rich, but he didn't leave heaven in the search of more riches because there was nothing more for him to gain. He wasn't looking for wealth or for power. All the wealth and the power in the universe was already his. And yet we read in our text that Jesus was rich and he became poor. He was that rich and he became poor. And just like rich, poor is relative. Then there's levels of poor. Some people consider themselves poor. So yeah, I got an old model car. You know, I don't own a property. Um, I only get this much as a salary. But others are far worse off. We had a couple of ladies in our church in India and they were struggling to pay the rent on where they lived. And it was a leaky hut and they were struggling to come up with $6 a month. The equivalent of Australian $6 a month. They were struggling to do that. That's why I felt pretty rich in India. But others are way worse off than that. And you go to any um, city in India and there's hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people that live on the street and they have no government benefit and they have no maybe uh, you know, a fixed income, they have no fixed place where they sleep and some of them are out there, they're doing battle with the rats and the cockroaches and disease and hoping to get some food for the day and it's like, my goodness... No money, no food most days. And people are born into that and they're, they're, they're poor. They're very poor. Some people know what it is to be rich and they go from rags or riches to rags rather. Not rags to riches. They go from riches to rags. I was reading about a guy in Ireland. He was the richest man in Ireland at one stage. His name is Sean Quinn. And he was worth about $6 billion dollars in uh, 2007 and he, he sunk quite a, a good part of his personal fortune into a bank, the Anglo-Irish Bank. And uh, within a few months, the, the bank suffered massive losses as the building industry in Ireland collapsed. And uh, this, what happened then was the uh, Ireland, the government, nationalised the bank a year later to present, prevent further collapse and in doing so wiped out his investment of billions of dollars into this bank. And the new bank seized ownership of his companies, including the Quinn Group, and forced him and his family off the board, leaving the family with less than $15,000 in cash. So they've gone in the process of about a year. They've gone from having about $6 billion assets to having $15,000 cash without that they've lost all their stuff. So my goodness. And even worse than that, if you, if you think it's possible, there was a guy had a fleet of jets, Texas billionaire Alan Stanford, he had a fleet of jets, a collection of yachts, even had his own professional cricket team. And at his peak, he was listed as one of the richest men in America. And in 2009, he was convicted of fraud and is now serving a term of 110 years for his role in a $7 billion international Ponzi scheme. Trying to scam people and they've said no. What gets me is people that are super rich and they go outside the law to try and get more money. That's astonishing to me. And I guess in a sense, these pictures are more like something we can grasp. It's like imagine having billions and, and you come down to nothing or, or you had billions and you come down to now you're imprisoned and you got nothing. And here's Jesus, a bit of a riches to rags story in our text, if you like. He went from being enthroned in heaven. He went from being worshipped in heaven to coming and being born in a stable on earth. 
And when you think about it, Jesus came into the world naked and without a cent to his name. And that's a, a fairly big come down from what he had before. But it tells us in Philippians 2 verse 6, 7 and 8, it says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. You can't get a bigger drop than what Jesus did. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. He gave up divine privileges, the privileges of being God. And he came instead and was born as a man and took the position of a servant, or the word literally means a slave. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Complete loss of his freedom. Publicly humiliated, crucified for something that he never did. He never did anything wrong. And so Jesus was born naked and without a cent to his name. And he died the same way. And yet he was God. And yet he could have called down a legion of angels. He could have commanded, you know, the stones to worship him. And he humbled himself. You can't get much poorer than being crucified. See, the people that wake up on the street in Calcutta, they're still rich compared to Jesus naked on the cross without any food, money, possessions or hope of getting any. Falsely tried and convicted, whilst completely innocent, a perfect man. Crucified, having been mocked and beaten and scourged and scorned with nails in his hands and feet and his life's blood drip, drip, dripping away. And that's a pretty, man, this is an Easter message, Pastor, isn't it? It's like, no, it's, a, it's an everyday Jesus message. It's what Jesus did. He came and he came as a child. It's nice to have the nativity mindset. It's nice to understand that God came and was vulnerable as a man. And that's a, another narrative and it's, it's valid. It's good. But this is who Jesus Christ is. And this is how poor he became for me and for you. He willingly gave up everything. Would you willingly give up the meagre, the minuscule riches that you have compared with some of the people I've mentioned? Would you give them up for anybody? Would you give it all away for anybody? And Jesus gave away so much more. More than bankrupt. The sins of the whole world placed upon him. An innocent man. He, he paid a debt that he did not owe. That's really poor. There's levels of poor. There's levels of rich. And Jesus was the top of both categories. The text says, For you know the grace, which means undeserved favour, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the undeserved favour for you and me, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. And this is what it says, that through his poverty, that you through his poverty might become rich. And we become way richer than Elon Musk could ever dream of. Because we've received eternal salvation. We've received the riches of God. We've received the inheritance that God's got for us. And so the word in our text there, through his poverty, and I've been trying to just bring this to life, if you like. It means a word, interesting word. It means Indians or in, indigent. Oh, I can't even say it. Indigence. And so indigence means a state of extreme poverty, destitution, seriously impoverished condition, a level of poverty in which real hardship and deprivation are suffered and comforts of life are wholly lacking. Jesus was rich, richer than we can imagine, and he became poor, poorer than we can grasp, so that we might become rich. And I want to finish with that thought this morning and consider that we might become rich. And I don't know about you, but, you know, as, as I said in India, as I began to listen to what people were saying, that you're rich, yeah, you're rich, you're rich, I began to realise I am rich. 
I began to look at what I had and, you know, maybe comparative to somebody else, but it's like, you know, I am rich. I'm rich. And I, I felt thankful and grateful that God had made me a rich man. But I realized as I spent time with, with uh, you know, somebody that was dying in a, uh, in a hospital room that they, they felt that they were rich. They were blessed and they had cancer and they were passing into eternity at a young age. And they said, don't worry, Pastor, the riches of Christ. And I was like, They've got a revelation of what life is all about. That they are rich way beyond what this world can do for you. And I'm not against having nice cars and leather upholstery, okay? Uh, I've got no problem with people doing well in their business or whatever, investing in all of those things. That's not wicked. The love of money opposed to the love of God and people is a very wicked thing. And it's, it's the root of many, many of the evils we see in the world. And so we love a rags to riches story. You know, the single mum wins lotto. Don't you love those stories? You know, it's like, yeah, come on. That's really good. And not really like that. And although God gives us, you know, the ability to make wealth, it's not really like the dollar kind value of rich. It's very, very temporary. And you can ask, you know, Alan Stanford or one of those other illustrations, those people I spoke about. And so as we finish this morning, how has he made us rich? And uh, three things I'll look at just quickly and then we'll pray and so how has Jesus made you and me rich and probably the first thing that I want to consider is that we're rich in that our debt has been cancelled when your debt's been cancelled if you've been in debt it's actually like you feel really rich when your debt's been cancelled years ago we were you know didn't uh, work high paid jobs gave ourselves to ministry and stuff had our uh, three kids and so we just had this this nagging amount on the credit card that just never seemed to get back down to zero and stay there it was always you know it was just a, a bit difficult and finally we cleared it and just felt so relieved felt really free and felt like a rich man that i didn't have a debt hanging over me and so we went out to celebrate on the credit card. No, we didn't. No. <laughs> One man said there's a greater debt than money that when cancelled really sets us free, and that's called forgiveness. Yes. Have you ever been forgiven by somebody and suddenly it's made right? Our relationship's right with the boss or with, the, with our family member or with our spouse or with somebody. It's like you've done something that's not right and you know it and, and you've messed up, but they forgive you. And it's just like, you feel like a rich man. I don't know about you, I, I felt forgiven. It's like the debt's gone. The Bible says our sins have been forgiven through Jesus' death on Calvary's cross. Amen. He's taken our sins. He's nailed the handwriting that was against us and, uh, and we're forgiven. And so, therefore, we are rich, spiritually rich, rather than spiritually in debt. Thank God for his goodness. The second thing is we're rich in that we're heirs, as in H-E-I-R-S, heirs. And we've all heard the stories of rich kids with, uh, you know, filthy rich parents and there's mansions and there's racehorses and there's, uh, you know, Bentleys and Aston Martins driving them to school and there's nannies and there's, you know, holidays in the Caribbean or whatever or French Riviera and, uh, you know, maybe they get some allowance. But the real money, the, the real dollars is kept for them in trust until they turn usually 21, maybe 18 or something, and they're bought up rich and, you know, at, uh, you know, at some future date, and then they'll be really, really, really rich. They're rich kids, they're living a rich lifestyle, but they're heirs to a fortune. One day they're going to inherit the whole, you know, kitten caboodle, and, and it's like, my goodness. Daddy's, you know, he, he's a lord. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a sir, he's a, you know, he's a, uh, an aristocrat or he's a uh, Fortune 500 company owner or he's a, you know, he's, a, he's an oil baron or something, whatever. He, you know, that, that's why so they're rich and there's a future richness coming to them and we know those stories. And so our daddy, the Bible says that one translation of Abba Father, we cry out by the spirit that's in us, Daddy, Daddy, Abba Father, because God has adopted us as his children and we're heirs and joint heirs together with Christ and if you understood any of the painting I'm trying to uh, the picture I'm trying to paint of how rich Jesus is we're heirs together with him he's the owner of the cattle on the thousand hills this is our daddy this is our father his streets are paved with goals and his uh, gates are giant pearls and emerald and uh, different other stones etc and we are deeded mansions in heaven 
That's what the Bible says is our future inheritance in Christ. And, uh, you know, we all know the real estate mantra, position, position, position. And if you drive down Merriweather Hill, you'll see a sign on the left as you look out over the, although you, you're looking at the traffic, you're not looking out over the, uh, the beach. <laughs> but if you did look over the beach, you'd see this tremendous view and there's a sign there and it's for sale and it says on the sign, best view in Merriweather. And uh, that's a, that'd be a cool house to have, best view in Merriweather. But located in heaven is a mansion with your name on the deed. I don't know about what this does to you, but it's like I'm a rich person. I've got stuff coming to me down the track. And whatever I do or don't do, whatever I get or don't get, whatever the, the banks do, whatever the superannuation fund does, whatever the, you know, uh, the government does, it, it doesn't really matter. Whether my health holds up or my health goes down, it, it doesn't matter what I have because this is all just temporary. Yeah. And I have an eternal riches in heaven. The third thing is we're rich in that we have a friend in Jesus. If you've ever had a really rich friend, you ever had a friend that's rich and they just want to pay for everything? One of those sort of friends? Everyone's shaking their going, no, I've got to pay myself. <laughs> it's really bad. You ever had a friend that rich that they buy the coffee? Have you ever had a friend that rich? <laughs> How you feel? It's like, oh, thank you. Or they pay the bill at the restaurant or something like that. And it's just, it's, it's good. It's nice. It's like, thank you. You sort of know you're going to be looked after because they're rich. And uh, the Bible says that Jesus is not only our saviour, we're not only forgiven, we have eternal life, we have a mansion in heaven, but he's our friend and he cares for you this morning. I don't know about you, but that is the, the reason I'm so rich is because I know Jesus. And thank God for the promises. Thank God the debt's been cancelled and I'm forgiven. Thank God that I can live a new life, that he can restore my mind and my morality. Thank God for all the promises in the word of God. But the number one thing that makes you and me rich this morning is Jesus Christ. We have Jesus as our friend. We have Jesus in our life. Hebrews 4.15 says... Uh, and 16, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He faced all of the same testings that we do, and yet he did not sin. So let us boldly come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. And whether your need today is help in a time of temptation, whether your need today is that God would help you with your conscience over things that torment you in your mind or whether it's fear or whether it's sickness or fill in the blank whatever your need is today Jesus is there and Jesus is there for you that's what the Bible tells us and I've, I've experienced it maybe you have to he became poor so that you could become rich let's bow our heads this morning rich in Christ rich in Jesus the ultimate gift is that he is an ever-present help in times of need. That we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. We're born again because of what Jesus Christ has done. Our text this morning says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he might become poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And I believe that... That's a true saying, we might become rich because not everyone becomes rich. Not everyone accepts and receives Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Not everybody acknowledges their sin before God and says, God, forgive me a sinner. Jesus, be my Saviour, be my Lord. Not everybody answers when Jesus knocks on the door. It's not automatic, in other words. We might become rich. Through his poverty, we might become rich. He had the ultimate position. He had the ultimate power. He had the ultimate riches and he gave it away and came as a man and died naked on a cross 2,000 years ago. That whosoever believes in him could have eternal life. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth, believing in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we'll be saved. The Bible says clearly, simply, the wages of sin is death. And that all have sinned, that there's none righteous, no, not one. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, as Jesus took our sins upon himself. 
Thank God for his grace and mercy towards us. Thank God for his love towards us that he would send his son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. While you were rich, you became poor for our sake so that we could gain the riches of Christ in our life. And this morning, I want to ask a question. Are you right with God? Are you right with Jesus? Do you have a relationship with him? Because if you don't, you can. You can have a relationship with the one who's rich far above we can begin to imagine. Not a temporary rich. As the Bible says, we're here for a moment and then we're gone. Like a puff of smoke that appears just for a short time, like a mist. And all of our riches will be left behind. We're rich because of Christ. Because we can be eternally rich. And this morning, you're not forgiven of your sins. You haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can this morning. And I want to give you an opportunity while heads are bowed, while we're praying. People are praying. Not to embarrass anybody, but as I said, Jesus died publicly, naked on a cross for you. You could acknowledge him before men and pray a simple prayer right here this morning in this service. And you'd like to this morning. And you could lift your hand to acknowledge, Pastor, look, I'm not a Christian, but I want to be. Pastor, I'm not a Christian because I haven't received Christ, but I want to receive him right now, and you can. Whosoever comes to him, he won't cast you aside. He won't, he won't say, no, you, you're not good enough. It's, it's, it doesn't matter how good or bad you are. None of us are good in his eyes, but he still loves us. And this morning, you want to make a, a commitment to Jesus Christ. You'd like to pray a prayer. You lift your hand, have someone pray with you. Great privilege to pray a prayer with you this morning to lead you to Christ, to help you to pray. Anybody at all, maybe once upon a time you prayed a prayer and you, you, you know what I'm saying, and says, Pastor, but in reality, your relationship with him, just like we read in Revelation, there's a church group and they're in church, but Jesus is on the outside. He's knocking on the door to get in. And I believe he does that in people's lives individually. And they know about him and maybe they're living a good life. These people said, man, we're rich and we're, we've got it going on. And Jesus said, you're wretched, poor, blind and naked. He had a different perspective altogether. And maybe Jesus is on the outside. You've pushed him away. You've locked him out of your life. He's not Lord. But you can make him Lord this morning. As they say, the handle's on the inside. It's, it's your decision. Only you can let Jesus into your life. And this morning, you're not right with God. You know what I'm saying is true, but you're backslidden in your heart. Jesus on the outside. You want to pray a prayer and get right with him this morning. Not inviting you to join the church, not inviting you to do anything religious or tricky, but to pray a simple prayer. Jesus, come in. Jesus, come into my life afresh. I want you to be Lord. I want you to sit on the throne of my heart. I want your riches. Praise God. I want to give you an opportunity just to pray for a few moments. And maybe even as I preach this whole message, that maybe there's a parallel that you could consider as we pray at the altar for a few moments, that God through his grace wants to use your life to bless others with the gift of Christ. And that comes sometimes through, we, we have riches, we have uh, preferences, we have time, we have money, we have resource, we have giftings. Will you spend some of that on someone else? Will you give some of that away to someone else that someone else could be saved? Will you serve someone else like Christ did? I get the privilege. I'm a Christian. I live in Australia. I got privilege. I got this job. I got that. I, I got privilege. But Jesus laid aside the privilege of, of heaven. Would you be prepared to lay aside some of the comfort, some of the privilege that you have in your life for somebody else? That you would witness to someone else. You would encourage someone else. You would serve someone else. That others would become rich. Because you know the way to true riches is through Jesus Christ. You can make a difference in someone's life. You can be a difference maker. I want to challenge you with that. You can pray about that as well. Maybe you want to come and just thank him for his goodness and, and, and recognise how rich you are in Christ and how the world's riches, although, yeah, we're, we're here and now and we, we, we understand how life works, but they're not the biggie. They're not the, the be-all and end-all in our life. Jesus Christ is. I want to give you an opportunity to pray. You can pray in your seat and come find a place, pray down the front. The altar's open this morning. Let's just spend a few moments as, uh, as Mick uh, plays this song for us. Thank you, my God.
for your wonderful gift in your son, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you laid down your life in obedience to the Father's plan. You laid down your life that we could be rich, that we could be free, that we could have life and life more abundantly. Thank you, Jesus. God, let this same mind be in me. Let this same mind be in us, Lord God, that we not look to be first, God, in a worldly sense, God, but we'd be willing to lay down our life for somebody, to make a difference in somebody's life, to be like you, Jesus. Lord, I'm asking God, cause this word to resonate in hearts this morning, cause this word to speak the thing that you want to speak, God, individually to us as your children. Father, help us this morning, Lord God, to get a sense of your presence speaking to us, Lord. helping us with perspective, helping us go with future decisions, but helping us to be able to rejoice in what you've done, that our, our true riches, God, our true wealth, our understanding of our own life is not tied at all to our back balance or the economy, it's just tied to you, my brother. to us as we read the word of God, as maybe we gather, we hear a sermon preached and God speaks to us in a, in a, in a level that maybe we didn't think before and God can speak to us about the richness that Christ had and, and what he gave up and the poverty that he experienced in laying down his life and the, the, because of that, the poverty that we've been rescued from and the riches that we now have. I don't know about you, but it just sort of it just blows my mind. It makes me want to worship him and thank him and live for him and maybe do that, do something good for somebody else. And it's such a powerful scripture, but it goes on in 
uh, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, and Paul speaks and he, he says, and we're going to take a communion in just a moment. And uh, maybe you can stand with me this morning where, if you'd like to take communion. And uh, he says this, Paul says, By the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 23, For I pass unto you what I received from the Lord himself on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, listen to the imagery here. Listen to what he's saying to us. He wants us to think on something horrific and gory. He wants us to, to focus on, and I, I get it, baby Jesus, and I'm into baby Jesus, and I'm into the nativity scenes and the, and the camels and the, all, the, all the stuff that we, you know, people uh, like, and, and it's like, that, that's cool, that's all good, and I love all the imagery in the scripture, but this is serious, and it's, it's in, in a sense, it's dark imagery, but it's the light that comes from the darkness. And, and, and Jesus said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And so Jesus said, when you do this, you proclaim my, my coming, what I've done for you, that you believe that my body was broken for you. And then he went in the Bible graphically, you know, we, we know in the, you know, Mel Gibson, we talked about him uh, a little bit earlier, the, the movie, The Passion of Christ. And it's like, it's like people were shocked. People were like, whoa, Christians were weeping. It's like, oh, is that what he did? And more. And he did that having given up his riches. And his body was broken for us that we could be forgiven for our sins. And I'm not here to whip you about your sins. And we all don't get it perfect even, you know, post-salvation. We're not perfect in our, in, in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions by any stretch. But the fact is we're forgiven because Jesus was willing to, to humble himself and give himself as a servant that died on a cross. And I don't know about you. And so for me, it's a pretty sobering sort of thing when we take communion and we say, this is the, the bread and we eat a little bit of bread and it's, it's, it's just all symbolism, but it's meant to trigger in our mind what Paul is saying here. He says, Jesus said this, this is my body, it's given for you and do this in remembrance of me and take it on board in your life. Chew on this for a while, you know, digest this in your life, what I've done for you. And I don't know about you, but it, it's sobering to me. It's like, whoa, it's intense. You guys are going to just hand that out. If you'd like to take some, you can and, uh, and we're going to go for it. We're going to just work through this, uh, this verse. Awesome. And we're not just going to make a big ritual out of it. We're, we're simply just wanting to consider what he's done for us in, in a real way, a personal way. It's between you and God. And, uh, and he said, this is my body. It's given for you. And it goes on and says, do this, you know, as you remember me. It says, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. He died for me. He died, but he rose again and he's coming back for us. Thank God. And so it goes on. Let me read a couple more verses. This is a New Living Translation. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. This is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honouring the, uh, the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. And this is, what many, this is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. That's pretty serious stuff for New Testament scripture. It's the Bible we, we believe in. And so I encourage you, maybe there's some stuff in your life that needs to be gone, that needs to be cut out, that God would say, judge it, repent of that. And uh, you can, and, and, and Christ is our advocate, and we can be cleansed of that, and we can move forward. But I encourage you, um, the attitude of our heart, we can examine our heart before we do this. So let's do this. Let's take of the bread, and Jesus said, this is my body, symbolically, obviously, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Let's remember him for a moment. Let's, let's eat the bread. Thank you, Father.
maybe today you can eat some really uh, yummy uh, pavlova or you can eat some uh, really lo yummy uh, roast and, and it's like, man, I've just eaten this dry piece of uh, Lebanese bread. My goodness, that's a bit dry pasta. Um, and that's not to punish us and there's nothing wrong with eating some uh, nice stuff later on. But it, it really is just a reminder. It's it's like, man, this is uh, it's pretty serious what Jesus did for me. And I, I just want to encourage you, be grateful, be thankful this morning. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying the cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. God's made a covenant with us that he's He's taken our sins away, that he's given us new life. We're born again in Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that's pretty awesome. And uh, and God doesn't break his deals. We don't have to take him to court later on and say, oh, you made a deal and you didn't. It's, it's like, no, we have complete confidence in him keeping up his side of the deal and so we've got a, uh, a deal that's uh, signed with the blood of Jesus with the word of God and we can have 100% confidence that we can bank our life on Jesus Christ build our life upon the rock of Christ let's take this uh, let's, let's drink this and remember the blood that was shed for us let's do this Thank you, Jesus, for your precious blood. Thank you, Lord, you laid down your life. You allowed your body to be broken for us. You allowed yourself to be crucified for our sins. Thank you, Jesus. close in a moment, we're just going to sing that song through just um, maybe we can sing uh, verse 1 in fact verse 2 let's go for verse 2 in the chorus let's just worship him for a moment presence of the Holy Ghost. Appreciate you coming out today. God bless your day. Go and love somebody today. Just do what you can do to show the love of Christ. Just going to close off in a word of prayer. Thanks, Jeff. Dear Jesus, I thank you that we can gather together on this day, Father, as we celebrate the gift of your son, Jesus. I thank you for the riches that you give to us, Father, Lord, both in the country we live in, Lord, in the relationships we place in our life, Lord, in our families, in our church, and in relationship with your son, Jesus, Father. I pray that you help us to dwell Father, on the riches that you have for us in eternity and the sacrifice of your son that facilitates all of this as we go. 
that you can help us today as we gather with family, um, to keep you in the center of it all, to uh, you know, keep us safe as we uh, met together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today.